and I have the shags. I'm coming. So, Fungi Kingdom. My name's Tracy. I'm not a mycologist, I'm just a mushroom enthusiast. This is everything that I've learned myself, what I've read, all my own photographs, all my own art, and everything I've learned through my experiences. So, what are fungi? Fungi, fungi. Estimated to be 1.5 to 5 million species exist, which a mere 80,000 have been described. So we don't know that much about mushrooms and fungi. Once believed part, to be part of the uh, plant kingdom up until 1969, but are in fact a kingdom of their own. So they differentiate from plants in the sense that they do not have chlorophyll to produce their own energy. Their cell walls contain chitin, which is found in insects and shellfish. So when you consider that, that's, they're actually more closely related to animals than plants. They include the largest and longest living organisms and they reproduce by spores. Types of fungi. There are yeasts, moulds and macrofungi or mushrooms. So yeasts and moulds are actually in fact a type of fungi. Yeasts are in things like uh, beer and some drinks, also in baking moulds. Also in things like penicillin, a lot of pharmaceuticals can also be, you might find a lot of moulds on in your house or decomposing food. Macrofungi, mushrooms, that's mainly what I'm going to talk about. So what, what are mushrooms? What are, what are fungi? So the macroscopic filamentous um, fungi that form large fruiting bodies, which we call mushrooms. Most of the fungus is actually underground. So you see a mushroom, it's only like the reproductive organ, like the actual, um, how it reproduces. You're not actually seeing the whole fruiting body, the whole mushroom. This underground main body is a network of fine white threads called hyphae or mycelium. So what is mycelium? Mycelium is the main sort of structure of the fungus. Each mycelium tip goes about its environment, acts as an individual and learning about its environment. The largest known organism, the honey mushroom, uh, covers more than 8.8 .8 square kilometers in Oregon and estimated to be 2,500 years old. It's also a um, parasitic fungus nicknamed the forest killer. Reproduction, how do mushrooms reproduce? So they reproduce by spores. Uh, spores are tiny little hyphae that are produced in the gills and um, they drift in the air current, float about, land on something and then turn into mycelium and then produce mushrooms. They can be heaps of different colors, so white, brown, black, you can see all the colors that got in the spore prints. Many mushrooms can only be identified by looking at the spore structure under a microscope. So if you want to identify down to species, you have to look at it under a microscope. Modes of nutrition. So all fungi can be put into these three groups, parasitic, saprotrophic, or mycorrhizal. So parasitic means it parasitizes on something else takes energy away from something else. Saprotrophic or saprophytic means it breaks down organic matter. And mycorrhizal is when it has a beneficial um, symbiotic relationship to a plant partner where it trades different nutrients with it, gets 10 to 30% of the food produced by the plant can then be transferred to the fungal partner. In terms of things like drought, a lot of plants rely on these mycorrhizal fungi. So black truffle is an example of a mycorrhizal fungi. Oh. So mycorrhizal is very important in the environment when you think about crops. There's on the right here, 
this has not been inoculated with mycorrhizal fungi. This has, so this, this crop is growing a lot better in drought. This fungus is ancient and has evolved with plants. The mycorrhizal filaments create an organic glue that binds soil and can resist erosion and aid in moving water into soil profile, preventing overland flow of soil. Saprotrophic is when fungus breaks down organic matter. So they break down uh, plant and animal material. They grow on dead trees, leaf litter, leaf litter, bones. They release an enzyme to break down and digest lignin, cellulose and chitin into simple soluble compounds that can then be absorbed by them, by plants, as nutrients. Parasitic, so parasitic fungus can also can parasitize on plants and animals. So this is a these are types of cordyceps. They actually parasitize, parasitize on insects. Very diverse family and used a lot in Chinese medicine. Other common examples of parasitic fungi are rust, smuts, and powdery mildew. So when we go to identify a mushroom, we think about the location. A lot of people go straight to the mushroom and try to identify it, but it's also just as important to think about the time of year, how wet it is, and the environment. Is it a natural bush environment? And also, is it growing under a tree? For example, this one only grows under this particular tree. What is the mushroom even growing from? Is it soil? Is, the, uh, is it growing on wood? Odor. So a lot of mushrooms smell like mushrooms until they definitely don't. For example, the one on the left smelled quite sweet and florally, floral. And the one on the right is quite acrid, smelled like rotting or decay. So odor is another key identification feature. The anatomy of the mushroom. So mushrooms vary quite a lot. They don't all have a cap, they don't all have gills, and they might not even have a start. But they will have one of these elements. So I guess trying to appreciate the whole anatomy and being able to put words to what you'll see is very important. So here, in this one, you can see there's gills, there's paws, and there's teeth. Um, they can have warts, they can have um, striations, they can have shags, they can have an annulus, which is like a skirt or ring, and they can have like a basal bulb or something at the base. And then there's mycelium. So, a universal veil is what a lot of Amanita have. It's a temporary tissue that fully envelops at the young mushroom. As it grows from the ground, it breaks open out of this universal veil and then there'll be remnants of the universal veil as the mushroom matures. So for example, this one is just breaking out of the soil, has parts of the universal veil, these sort of warts, I guess you'd call, on top, just sort of breaking apart more and the one on the left is actually being washed off. Not all mushrooms have a universal veil, but it's a prominent feature in Amanita species. So these are all native Amanita. Here you can see it looks like clay, but that's actually part of the universal veil. This is actually quite um, chunky, so you can't really remove it. Whereas the top left, you can actually scratch them off. And this one's sort of just right in the middle. These are all Amanita as well. So Amanita muscaria, this mature one has the uh, veil remnants have been washed off or rubbed off. And the young one is only just sort of breaking apart. And this one actually has none. So not all Amanita have remnants. 
So the partial veil, not to be confused with the universal veil, so the partial veil is a membrane that protects the gills. We also call it a skirt or an annulus or a ring. This may be persistent and remain throughout the, the whole life of the mushroom or they may just disappear with age. So the role of the partial veil is pr to protect the gills until the spores and gills mature enough and then it usually breaks apart or disappears with age. So here you can see it's got quite a cottony sort of fibrous texture, whereas this annulus or partial veil is actually more like a ring. It's not attached to the bottom and attached to the top, so that's what you call a movable annulus. It's got this um, cog wheeling, so this is a um, uh, yellow stainer, also what we call the, the vomiter, so this is actually a key feature for this species. And this amanita, the partial veil is quite close to the gills, so that's a key feature to look out for, where on the, the stem or the stipe the partial veil is. And here it's actually more like a web, very ephemeral. Here are a whole heap, of, heap more of the partial veil. So here you can see the spore deposits, dark brown on top. And here, like they can be very small and then, or they can be more like a, a skirt with like a nice fringe. So cap shape. Trying to differentiate between a few different cap shapes, very important. Does it have, is it like a funnel? or does it have a point or does it have like an umbo, like a little bump in the center? Keeping in mind that as much all mushrooms mature, the cap shape changes. So here you can see um, this one has a central depression with striations and it has scalloped edge. A few more different cap shapes. So this is a young yellow stainer or the vomiter. It's got a boxy sort of shape and it keeps that boxy shape throughout its life. So that's a key feature for that species. This one has a central umbo with striations and this, this spring field cap always flattens out when it's mature. So stipe. Stipe is what another word for the stem. What is the length of the stipe? What is the texture? Is it larger at one end? Um, is it hollow or solid? Does it have markings? Just feeling the stipe as well. So this is a short sort of stubby stipe. This one has like fibrous texture. This one comes up with mycelium. Stipe base. Does it have an enlargement at the base of the stipe? Does it have more like a club shape? Does it have markings? So unearthing the mushroom to identify it is very important. All psilocybes, so psilocybe are your magic mushrooms, they come up with mycelium. Um, or they might have a basal bulb, so like a sort of cut at the base. This is your death cat mushroom, so it has like an actual vulva or like a grows out of a, a cup. Not many mushrooms have that, so it's a really good feature to look out for. Whereas, yeah, Amanita muscaria has these markings or um, rings or zonations. Gills. Not all mushrooms have gills, but most. Gills, what colour are the gills, how many gills, how they attach to the stipe, can you see the spores, and do all of the gills go straight to the stipe or do most or half or not many. So gill attachment, very important and very underlooked when people are trying to identify their mushroom. So, 
does it travel right down the stipe? Does it travel down the stipe a little bit? Or does it not even attach to the stipe? Here are some more gills. So this is like your store-bought agaricus. There's a lot of gills and they do not attach to the stipe, whereas all of the others, they do attach to the stipe. For example, this one hardly even has a stipe. And then these are some examples of honeycomb-shaped gills. So they do the same things as the other gills, they just have different shapes. And then there's a few species called, uh, there's a species called Lactaria, so they actually exude a latex when you cut the gills or any other part of the mushroom. And then these gills are, have um, more like a maze sort of shape. And then there's mushrooms that their spores actually liquefy and they produce more of like an ink than instead of powdery spores. Then there's mushrooms that have a split gill, so this actually, the gills actually split into gill, two gills. This is a shell fungi as well. Then there's mushrooms that have teeth instead of gills. This is a edible mushroom. I actually recommend it because you can't really confuse it with anything else. So each little tube, or what you call tooth, the spore is produced in the cap of the mushroom, travels down the tube and comes down the bottom there. Shell fungi, so these are all mushrooms that grow on trees or logs. They can have a whole heap of different shapes, so they're called leathers, conks, plates, depending on the shape and texture. A lot of shell fungi have pores instead of gills. And here you can see with this species, they have a dark spore. So you can just see, it's very dark in each of the pores, so you can just see the spore. And the flesh is pale. Here are some more uh, shell fungi. Beef steak fungus, which is actually an edible one. Doesn't taste like beef, but it looks like beef. <laughs> actually tastes like citrus. Here are some more, you can actually see each tube where the, the spores come out of, and they actually stain pink. So leathers. Leathers are shell fungi and they are pliable. Here are some more examples of different leathers, and these are all very common around here. And then there's always an exception of shell fungi with gills. There's always an exception with fungi. So bleats are a mushroom that have a spongy surface with pores instead of gills, like most typical mushrooms. Here are some examples of some bleats. So this particular beet, the leek, um, as soon as you cut it, it turns bright bluish green. And that's chemical reaction, as soon as it oxidizes, it goes bright, Cha the color changes. Here are some more examples of bleats, and they decay very quickly. So they have like a very soft flesh and more spongy. more examples of bleach so here you can actually see very clearly that spongy surface that um, spongy part we'll go through a few different species of mushrooms so bonnets are very small mushrooms that are that can grow in massive clusters they are they can be very very tiny they all have white spores. They can grow on wood and soil. For example, like these ones, very, very beautiful. 
um, Mycena interrupter. The key feature here is it actually grows out of a little blue pad. And yeah, you can see the comparison to my hand, some of them can be very, very tiny. So wax cuts, they can be very small and usually low to the ground. They are very, most, most of them are very colorful. So here are some examples of some wax caps, also called high gross eye. So they vary a lot, but I've usually seen them in reds and oranges and yellows. Here are some examples. I've seen them growing like big clusters on wood. Disc and cup fungi. So disc and cup fungi, like the name suggests, looks like discs and cups. They can be soft or they can be quite hard. So these are a few varieties of disc and cup fungi. These ones are very, very minuscule and these ones are quite large. The inside of the cup is where the spores are produced. So if you imagine like a raindrop come in and splash in there, that's how the spores are um, dispersed. This is orange peel fungus. It's an edible variety and pretty easy to identify. It's very eye-catching. Yellow earth buttons. They're very, very tiny, but not as tiny as some other ones. So this one, also yellow fairy cups. They only grow on wood, whereas the other ones grow on soil. They, these ones do have a style, and they were minuscule. This is another type of wood cup and yeah, you can see the size in comparison to my finger. You can see I even painted my fingernail to match the mushroom. <laughs> so jelly fungi, like the name suggests, they are usually quite gelatinous and this one is an edible variety. When they dry out, they go quite crusty and sad looking. Here's some more jelly fungi. They start off very, very tiny, like minuscule little things pointing out of wood, and then they open up and fan out. So they're called fan-shaped jelly fungus, is their common name. And they vary quite a lot. I love this photo with the jelly fungi and the other mushroom. So, Earth stars, they are a part of the puffball family. It says like this is the puffball. They start out underground with this outer casing, merges out of the ground. That outer casing opens up and forms this, this star. And then the spores are produced inside this little this casing, this sack. And then it opens up and the spores are pushed out of the little cup when someone pokes it or rain, <laughs> rains on them. I've also learned that they keep producing spores. So each time you poke it, you can keep poking it and it will produce more spores. Here's some more varieties. So this one is called Beak Earth Star. So it has a little beak there and it has a stipe attached to the outer casing. Puffballs, I think everyone's familiar with puffballs. Um, but they actually vary quite a lot. They can be quite soft, they can be quite large, they can be, they can have this um, spiky sort of texture. And then there's earth balls, which uh, differentiate from puffballs in the sense that they have a tougher outer casing. The indigenous Aboriginals would actually eat this, this puff ball, Pistolithus, when it's immature. And in different cultures, they would actually use this puff, this earth ball, as a dye. So, stink horns. This is a really interesting section of mushrooms because they vary quite a lot. They look like alien type organisms. 
So, with a lot of stinkhorns, the way that they reproduce is they create this liquid that smells quite a lot, has a lot of spores in it. It attracts flies, the flies get excited by this goo and wriggle around in it, and then they move the spores around by in that way. Can become a pest when a lot of these stinkhorns come up in mulch, so in council sort of gardens and things like that, and they produce a pretty bad smell. Clubs, corals and earth tongs, they are usually quite fleshy or quite intricate. I actually have some I could hand around. So, I might hand these around. So this is uh, fairy fingers I've only ever seen in one particular location. And the whole outer, outer section of the, the fungus produce a spore, so if you imagine the wind coming along, going up there, drifting the, the spores around. They are. And it's like how coral. Like yeah, yeah, well that, a lot of them called coral fungi. So, <laughs> Romaria, Romaria, um, a lot of people have, has anyone seen these type of fungus? So they grow in like clusters like this. They can be yellow, white, red, pink, orange. These are all pretty common, but they all have slight variations. So you can see this is quite open, like flame, I guess you'd call it. And then these are much closer like cauliflower. And then this particular species of Artomyces only grows on wood and the key feature for this particular species has what is called a crown. So it's like a little, um, on top of each of these fingers, um, has what you call a crown. And earth tongues, so I hand around some of the earth tongues. And I've seen them grow in massive clusters like this in uh, around Chilton. So, edible, medicinal and psychoactive mushrooms. This is saffron milk cap. A lot of people go foraging for. Turkey tail mushroom. So I actually have some of the turkey tail mushroom. Turkey tail is a medicinal mushroom. Has um, powerful antioxidants and other compounds that may help boost your immunity and help fight certain cancers. Good for your gut. You can make a tea out of it or you can make tinctures. I just sell it dry like that. So how do I identify turkey tail? It has sort of striations, like these zones on top, these rings. They can vary quite a lot in color. Underneath is white and they have they are quite pliable so they're a type of leather they're in the grow on wood as long as underneath is white like you can't really confuse it with too many so magic mushrooms these are pretty there's a lot of lookalikes with these so this is native suicide suborigenosa it grows in a whole heap of different um, environments. They have um, that so, sort of caramel cap. They bruise blue when touched. They have um, dark purple to black spores. And they have a white stipe. They are what you call hygrophonous. So when they are wet or dry, they change color. So for example, here you can see it is changing color. It's actually drying out in the center, so it's quite pale and still quite moist on the outside. They also have what is called a pellicle. So a pellicle is a gelatinous layer on, over the cap. You can actually peel this off, peel this off. And not many mushrooms have that. So that's a good identification feature. 
So I do want to say there are also a lot of poisonous and even deadly lookalikes. So picking should be left to the experienced or with someone who can positively identify. A lot of research has been undertaken to treat PTSD, mood disorders, addiction. And in, I think, 1st of June or July, they finished all their clinical trials and now it's actually being used in a therapeutic um, setting. So it is actually being used to treat this. So, gourmet and edible. Here I've got some saffron milk cups and a um, amanita muscaria and morels. So I have some dry morels. They, it is morel season now. So, uh, morels or mochella. I have mochella australiana. It's a native morel that resembles the European morel species. These are actually unique to Australia. So they are actually related to cut fungi and that are highly regarded by foragers. They are notoriously hard to cultivate and they are actually um, one of the most expensive mushrooms to buy because of that. So you can't really confuse these with anything else. They are hollow inside and they grow in native habitat. Woody, so Woody, I wouldn't actually say grows around this area, but more north from here. So they grow on wood. They are, when they are fresh, they are quite soft and pliable, velvety. And when they dry, they're crunchy. And you can actually buy it from the supermarkets called usually black fungus or dried woody. Very popular in Chinese cuisine. So saffron milk caps, they only grow with pine trees, so they're an introduced species. So they have that symbiotic relationship with pine trees. They are pretty easy to identify. They're a lactarius, so they exude a orange sort of latex. It can stain your fingers. Their baby mushrooms are blue. <laughs> I think that is very adorable. Um, they have when they're really wet, they have pock marks, and this, this actually exudes water when they're quite wet. And they have rings or zonations on top, like you can see here. And they're usually orange and a little bit, bit of white or pink. Macrolepiota clelendii is probably one of my favorite mushrooms to eat. It's a native. They, you can't really confuse them with too many things. They have that long, thin stipe. They're very quite elegant. They have this um, shaggy, um, delicate shags, what, I, what you call delicate shags. Their margin or the edge of the cap has quite a lot of shags. The gills are white. They do not attach to the stipe. They have an annulus as well. So armillaria or honey mushrooms, armillaria also includes the honey mushroom, the largest and longest living organism in the world in Oregon. Um, they are parasitic and they are also edible. Grow in clusters, they usually grow in native trees. They have white gills, they have a pretty iconic uh, annulus. They are quite fibrous on top. Chamella fusiformis, or also um, known as snow fungus. It is actually a parasitic fungus that targets other fungi. So it's been cultivated in China since the 19th century. And they would have to actually grow two species of fungus. It is used in uh, a lot of sweet dishes, but I've used it as a substitute for like rice noodles. You can chop it up and it keeps that structure. Also used in medicinal and beauty products in China. It doesn't grow here. Yeah, yeah it it's, it's actually an international fungus. It's a common fungus. Common fungus, yeah.
um, you would call these slippery jacks. They also grow in pine plantations. So a lot of people that forage in pine plantations get the slippery jacks and the saffron mealcaps. You wouldn't want to eat this outer gelatinous layer. You peel that off and you, then you cook what is left. They also grow with a lot of introduced species. Here are a few more edible mushrooms. So you field mushrooms, echidnum, which I would say is one of the easiest ones to identify because you don't see many with teeth like that. And a few other species, but I don't want to complicate it too much. So deadly poisonous mushrooms. This is your death cap or your Amanita phylloids. Few key features here. So it has a what you call a vulva or a, a, a basal bulb or sac that it grows out of. Here you can see the young mushroom emerging from that universal veil. And then as the mushroom matures, it might still have part of that universal veil on top. They have white gills and they attach to the site. They can be uh, bronze or gold or yellowish in tone. They only grow with oak, chestnut or pine. I've never actually seen them grow around here. I've only seen them grow one time in Albury and it was under an oak tree. They are becoming quite prominent in major cities, but they're also a seasonal mushroom and yeah, they only grow in relationship with introduced species. So they are the most um, poisonous of all mushrooms. They contain a thing called amatoxins, which cause kidney and liver failure. Eating half of a mushroom is enough to kill an adult. So these toxins are heat resistant, so cooking it doesn't change, doesn't actually change anything. As soon as you've eaten it, there's not much you can actually do. You usually feel a bit better. After a few days, your kidneys and liver actually shut down. There is actually some research going into a antidote for death cat poisoning. So invasive species. We have a lot of invasive species, but only two listed invasive fungi. This is uh, orange ball fungus, also called orange ping pong bats because they look like tiny little ping pongs. They grow on wood. They are transported by bushwalkers with the spores getting on the, their shoes and clothes, going to other bush tracks. Amanita muscaria is actually an invasive species. It's also a psychoactive mushroom. It's also a poisonous mushroom, medicinal mushroom, and um, gourmet mushroom, and then invasive species. So it's all of it. Also, the most iconic, recognizable mushroom that people think of. It's in a lot of our fairy tales, it's in a lot of our culture, it's even in a lot of our religion. So, how do I identify them? They grow, they're introduced species, so they only grow with introduced trees, so in pine plantations. They have uh, warts, so remnants of that universal veil on top. These can actually just be picked off. Um, they have an emulus, so that, that skirt underneath. They have a basal bulb there. And yeah. So I usually see them when I'm picking saffron milk caps. They are very abundant. Very, very abundant. Here, I'll talk about a few other mushrooms. So this is a uh, rustula, also called as brittle gills. So they have a chalky sort of crumbly texture. Some of these are edible, but I wouldn't recommend them for beginners. There is some toxic as well. This is one of my favorite mushrooms. It's uh, just very impressive. It's got remnants of that partial veil hanging on the edge there. They smell quite acrid. They have a beautiful spore grid and a very large sort of chunky basal bowl. 
This is a native one as well. This is yellow stainer, also called the vomita. It is a type of agaricus, so it could be confused with the field mushrooms. So how to identify is they have, uh, when you scratch it or cut it, they have yellow staining or bruising. When you were to break it or crush it, they have quite a chemical smell, like fennel. They have a brown spore print. They have an emulus, and they have this boxy sort of shape. Sometimes the emulus or this partial veil can fall off, but underneath they have this cogwheeling that not all field mushrooms have. So if you were unsure, another way to identify is if you were to put it in a microwave and cook it a little, if it smelt quite chemical or acrid, then it's probably a yellow stainer. They also grow in suburbs and things like that. Another Amanita that I quite like, native Amanita. It's got this whole color scheme happening. So you can see the partial veil remnants are breaking apart. You can actually scratch these off. This is Shaggy Parasol. I include this mainly because in some books it does say it's edible, but some books it says that it is not, mainly because a lot of people have allergic reactions. So I would say it's definitely not edible. They are quite beautiful and impressive. They can grow, grow quite large, quite low to the ground. They have these shags that you can actually peel off. They can also be confused with another um, toxic mushroom, so just I wouldn't think about eating anything like that. Ghost fungus is, uh, they have this bioluminescence that is a result of a unique enzyme that reacts with oxygen, causing it to eliminate in a similar way to fireflies and plankton. So it's actually the gills that glow, they have this greenish glow. They grow at the base of trees. This ghost fungus or Omphalotus nudiformis is actually a poisonous mushroom and can be confused with native oyster mushroom. They also vary quite a lot. So here you can see some purples and browns and oranges, but they can also be white and gray and black. So they, not black, but dark. So they vary quite a lot, but they're Fruiting bodies are generally quite impressive. So cordyceps, this is one of my, <laughs> another one of my favorite mushrooms. <laughs> so it parasitizes on the Australian ghost moth. The larvae burrows underground and is affected by the fungus, which will grow from the head of the, or the, the base of the actual caterpillar and come out of the bow and produces this mushroom, expose it to the air where it can release its spores. So it's very, very complex. It also only grows under a particular type of wattle. So it needs this, um, this bug and this, this tree, very unique. So you can actually see the, that part is the actual caterpillar and that part is the, the mushroom. And the whole caterpillar has been myceliated, so it's actually white with mycelium. That's dead. Yeah, but like, it, it's no longer bug, it's actually mycelium now. Oh, it's become a mushroom. Yeah, yeah. Fascinating. So exciting. So, spore printing. Spore printing can be really helpful to further understand mushrooms and explore mushrooms can help with identifying and creating a unique art. So if you're wanting to do a spore print, you cut off the cap of the mushroom, put it down on paper. If you're unsure about what color spore, then you can put it over two sheets of paper and you leave it overnight. If it's dry, then you can put a cap, uh, cup or bowl over the mushroom 
so that they don't shrink and um, smudge your spore prints. And here are some spore prints. This is a spore print of kidnum, so the truth fungi. You can actually see the little teeth and the way the spores are dispersed. If you're wanting to understand, like, differentiate a manita and an agaricus, so agaricus is like your um, the mushrooms you buy from the store, your portobello. Amanita does include Amanita phylloid, so your death cap. You could do a spore print. There's other ways to identify, but it's an interesting exercise. I have a whole heap of spore prints if you want to have a look at. I've written all the um, species names on all of the prints. Any questions? Uh, is the ghost fungus common? I would actually say yes. I've seen quite a lot. Yeah. Um, only in native bush. Um, and they, they're also very impressive. They're, you can't miss them. Like they grow into massive fruit, fruiting clusters. Um, but that's usually autumn. So I've only seen them grow early autumn. Yeah, um, all the photos you've seen are um, my photos. They're usually Wumagama, Aubrey, Wodonga, Chilton, um, just around about, not Henty. Um, yeah, so around Nail Can Hill, all the cut fungi, they were all around Nail Can Hill. Um, you find a little microclimate and then there's just a little whole, hop of, whole lot of mushrooms. Um, this is actually my short, my short version of my mushroom talk. I have another mushroom talk in two and a half weeks. I've got some flyers if anyone wants to go to it. Here you go. <laughs> so you should do another presentation this afternoon if she's got nothing to do. Okay. <laughs> And then we'll shout your lunch. <laughs> I'll be around here for a while if anyone wants to chat. Does mostly come out at the same time or do they all come out at different They do whatever they want to do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> How long do you um, make How long do you make a Well, what you're actually seeing is just the fruiting body. The little, if you imagine, see an apple. Do you want a flyer? Thank you.